Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, Principal Atmospheric Scientist at Nutrient Ag Solutions, and I want to thank you for watching this weekly Ag Weather Update brought to you by the Farm Credit Associations of North Carolina. Well, today is December 21st, and therefore it is the winter solstice for the Northern Hemisphere. And I thought you might just kind of want to learn a little bit about it. For them. So let me take about 30 seconds and share with you some cool stuff here. Okay, we can clearly see that yesterday on Sunday, this is the day-night line, so the sun was rising here. I'll draw you a second line. It's going to cut right here across the middle, of course, we call that the equator. Now, what's neat about these two lines is if you take the first one and draw a perpendicular line from where they cross out to the edge, the angle between these two is 23.5 degrees. And therefore, the Tropic of Capricorn, which on the day today is where the sun's rays are most direct, uh, is uh, the edge of the tropics. Now, the particular day is called the solstice, and solstice translates into sun stop. It's the highest angle that the sun will get in the sky in the southern hemisphere throughout the year, and it's the lowest in the northern hemisphere. And you can see here the angle at which the sun's rays strike the earth. So that's kind of neat. So we're in seasonal transition, and we're going to be watching how these seasons change. And since we're talking about that, why don't we talk about some seasonal information for you here? Let's update this latest long-range outlook first. Okay, right now, pretty strong trade winds screaming in this direction, meeting up with some strong westerly winds right in through here. This La Nina seems to be making its last big push, and I've been to discussing that in the last couple of videos. Well, given that as the setup, I want to show you if the La Nina is reaching a, a bottom here at week 52 on this year and it starts to recover, well, what does that mean? We well, can use these analog gears as a guidance, uh, guidance on that, and let me show you what I've got. So using only those analog gears, and I've got those listed up here, and we're looking at the time period of January through March. This is looking back over NOAA's data at um, climate division precipitation anomalies. And you can see that it favored an Ohio River Valley storm track, pretty wet here in the Pacific Northwest, but it was drying the Southern Plains, drying the Southwest, and look at this, dry along the Carolinas. And that's something I'm concerned about moving forward throughout this winter. Again, this is only using the La Nina analog years as my predictor. From there, we do know that the western part of the United States is still dealing with a substantial amount of drought, and we overall didn't see much drought monitor change when the latest map was released last Thursday, but still, it's quite expansive. We do have some drought that is to our south and some that is to our west over here in the eastern part of the United States, uh, but overall, the, the greatest drought is to the west. Now, thinking about that, I went to the Drought Monitor website and I grabbed this uh, map here, or this graph, excuse me, that goes back to the year 2000 when the Drought Monitor was started. And I just put a black line there showing you the 60th percentile. And that is referring to what percentage of the land area of the lower 48 was covered in drought. Now, here's a couple things I want you to note. When we think about drought, look at this. In 2002, during the summer, we broke that. We did it again in the summer of 2003. 2006, 2007, those summers also broke that 60% uh, uh, mark. We did it in the summer of 2012, again in the summer of 2013. But look at this. Most recently, here as we transitioned uh, out of December 2017 into January 2018, we did it. And right now, we're at the very end of this. So leaving December 2020, going to 2021, or above 60%. So these last two times, we actually reached a peak in our drought in uh, winter. Uh, and so the question is, is that drought area going to be changing? Now, when we look back over the January to November time period of this year, the whole country ranks as the 75th wettest, which is almost smack dab in the very middle of our 126-year record uh, in total. But look at how it was split up across the United States. As you can imagine where all that drought is in the West, it's extremely dry. For example, Utah having its driest year so far on record, whereas North Carolina is having its wettest. There you are, ranked at 126. Now, giving you a quick refresher, the January, February, and March precipitation patterns are favoring, as you can see here in both models, drier conditions toward the south and east with that active Ohio River Valley storm track. We're going to have to watch that carefully to see if it, it does push a bit farther toward the Appalachian Mountains and then over them into the Carolinas. So that's what I'll be watching for January, February, March. Talking temperatures, same years. These are the La Nina analogs temperatures compared to normal. And you can see that north of that area there, overall, the temperatures favored cooler, whereas we were warmer to the south and warmer up the east coast. And so at this point, if we had to say, well, what do the analogs say? Slightly warmer than average and drier than average. 
We have some new data that just came out last week from the IRI multi-model group. And you can also see, look at this, the drier conditions here and there with that active Ohio River Valley storm track and more mild here over in parts of Texas, New Mexico, but stretching up to the East Coast. So very interesting that the analogs are matching what we've got here from our new statistical forecast uh, from the IRI multi-model group. So I wanted to share that with you as we got going. Now, over the weekend, we saw, uh, actually in the last seven days, we saw two big chances of, or not chances, but two big episodes of rainfall. One was the big nor'easter that really just pounded parts of Pennsylvania and New York. Some places they're picking up over 40 inches of snow. And then we had that second system that moved through the lower Mississippi River Valley that went through us basically last night. Now, in the longer term in this forecast, look at what I'm watching change here. And when I say longer term, I'm talking about the next 10 to 15 days. Four areas. Are you ready? First one is here. Now, it doesn't look like much, does it? But that is actually the top of the Walker cell, which is right now in, in kind of advanced or hyper mode with this La Nina. This is starting to weaken. And we're starting to actually see some subtropical jet stream flow showing up here. That's bullet point number two. Bullet point number three, look at the strongest winds in the jet stream. Do you see how they're bending a bit farther to the south? I see that at the same time as the fourth op, uh, figure here, feature here, which is this big ridge that's building into Greenland. We actually call that the negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, and that gives us much cooler risks over the south and east. Okay, those four things added up. Let's use them to forecast the weather. As we work out over the next 10 days, we're going to favor, because of the big negative NAO pattern, more activity up the coast. And you can see that we're expecting wetter than average conditions from Georgia all the way to the Mid-Atlantic. And we're, of course, trapped in between there. Keep that in mind. The pattern is going to stay relatively open and moving. Here's the trough sweeping through early this morning, kicking that rain off the coast. We then get a ridge that builds in behind it. So see it there by Wednesday. But you notice what's coming through the midsection of the country as we then get out toward Christmas Eve. And this is on Christmas Day. So deep trough sweeping through on Christmas Day. Now that races on out as well. But behind it, another trough sweeps through on Monday into Tuesday of next week and cuts just to our south. So we're going to see more precipitation out of that as well. This pattern's open. You can just see all of these troughs just kind of daisy chained around the northern hemisphere. One, two, three, four, five. They're just orbiting around uh, the, 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 the North Pole here, which is what we'd expect. I mean, this is an active time of year. So last night, there was a scattered precip that kind of moved its way out. And as we get to early this morning, things are clearing out. As we work our way through the day on Monday, it's going to be a relatively dry day. And even as we get into Tuesday, maybe just some snow showers over toward the Appalachian Mountains, but that's really going to be just about it. High pressure builds in. Look at that by the time we get into Wednesday. So relatively calm. I'd even go as far as saying boring start to the week will be a little cool. I'll show you those temperatures in a minute. But this is the story I want to start to tell. See the low that's building here? This is the load that's going to continue to push toward the end of the week and really start to get things back unsettled again. To see it, though, I got to go over to the European model and let's pause it right there. Wednesday afternoon. Now, we're still going to be in the influence of high pressure, and you can definitely see that. With that warm up that comes at the end of the week, though, it will be met with a sharp transition by the time we get into Christmas Eve morning. This is where we start to see the precipitation building in. As we get into Christmas Eve evening, look at the heavier rains we are expecting with snow on the backside in the Appalachian Mountains. So notice that. This is now getting into Christmas morning right here. The front blasts on through in the overnight hours and clears out, except for some scattered snow that could still be in the Appalachian Mountains on Friday morning. After that, we do have a relatively windy Christmas day, but high pressure builds in over the weekend. Now, what we're watching is this is Sunday afternoon, high pressure still in place, but that next low starts to take shape here over parts of the Ozarks. And you're going to see as we go from Sunday into Monday morning, there it is, that low starts to show up here, Tennessee and Kentucky, and then Monday afternoon and evening brings in the next substantial round of some precipitation. So you can see, I told you, the pattern's pretty active. We had the stuff this morning, it's gone. Three days of relatively benign weather. Toward the end of this week through Christmas, unsettled again. We get a break for the weekend, and then it goes back up again Monday and Tuesday. That's our story through our next eight days or so. 
total accumulated precipitation. Well, here's what it looks like for the country. So some of those places that have been uh, kind of ridden with drought continuing to see drier conditions here. But let's zoom in and take a look at some of the numbers we're expecting for North Carolina. And again, this only goes through Sunday night, which is really just the first system. What I want to tell you is be on the lookout for anywhere between three quarters of an inch and an inch and a half of precip out of that. Uh, the banding nature here tells me that we're not going to be able to see where exactly that's going to be coming through until the front actually arrives. So I'm just telling you to be prepared prepared for that once we get toward the 23rd, 24th, and then exiting here on the 25th. From there, any snow? Well, yeah, you can see that got to get up here in the Appalachian Mountains, but the chances for picking up a couple of inches do exist uh, in this area. All right, so just want to make you aware of that. And if you're looking for that white Christmas, I'm going to tell you the same thing I told you last week, and that is just head north. They still got plenty of snow here. Unfortunately, with the warm-up that's going to be happening in this area, it's going to get slushy and gross before it all refreezes again and some new snow comes in. That map, if you've been looking at it over here on the right, shows you through the next five days, which takes us out to the night of Christmas Day, uh, the probability of getting an inch of snow, an inch of new snow. Now look at this, going into the last week of 2020, the jet stream is just really wanting to keep cranking here. That's the big ridge going toward green then, but look at the trough sweeping through here. This one's gonna come racing through and it's gonna again bring in some unsettled weather to the eastern part of the US. And even as I go all the way out here to January 5th, the jet stream is still screaming off the Pacific. It dives into troughs here in the central part of the United States. And there's that ridge going up toward Greenland. So this is going to keep the pattern open and active and keep sweeping storm systems through. Nothing about this suggests blocking up the United States for our weather patterns. So what do we see? We see the precip coming in here, reinvigorating the lows in the midsection of the country, and then they head up the coast, which is why we do not see drier conditions all the way through January 4th. In other words, nothing's pointing toward a sustained longer dry time period. From there, let's talk temperatures. Now, North Carolina, you can see the number 124 in there. It was our second warmest January to November time period on record. Again, these records go back to 1895. Our neighbors to the north there in Virginia had their warmest. Lately, though, all the above average temperatures have been in the northern tier of the U.S. with cooler weather stretching across the southern tier, getting over and toward North Carolina, where really we're hitting, sitting just a hair below normal on our temperatures. But watch the progression of temperatures this week. Remember, these maps, the numbers tell you the highs. The color shading tells you the difference from normal. As we go from Monday into Tuesday, major warm up in the midsection of the country. We still have the cooler weather to do with here. But as we go from there into Wednesday, and Wednesday into Thursday. So this will be Christmas Eve. This is the big warm up as the precipitation comes through, followed by the big drop off in temperatures on Christmas Day. So expect a major change from one day to the next, Thursday into Friday this week, with much colder air and the chance for snow coming in here. Going into the weekend, the cold air tries to exit east, but it's still chilly on Saturday and on Sunday. And as we look out there longer term, with all that heat building toward Greenland, that's the negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, it does favor the cooler weather here over the east and southeast. We're going to hang out our cooler bias. Beyond that, though, the models are really not keyed in very well on the temperature pattern through the beginning of January. You see the GFS is warm and the European is near average to cool. One of the reasons why has to deal with this, the polar vortex. By the end of this week, it is going to be very strong. But I want you to look at that graphic over there on the right. I'll draw it in white, okay? Polar vortex strength is here right now, and it's going to get stronger. Now remember, the stronger it becomes, the tighter its grip is on the cold air. And then as we then get into January, it's expected to become disrupted and weaken again. So remember, on these graphs, when you go down this direction, weak polar vortex, cold air is coming out somewhere. Up on these graphs, strong polar vortex, the cold stays north. Okay, from there, take a look at this. Over on the left, I'm showing you where the polar vortex is kind of sitting once we get into uh, the end of the, uh, of the month. Uh, it's strong, though. And overall, it's yet to be fully disrupted. So there's one lobe of it here, another there, but the anchor uh, of the center of the circulation is sitting right here. But do you see this? That warm-up we're experiencing in this area, well, watch what happens when we go beyond day 10. To do that, I'm going to show you the GFS run. 
See how it punches right here over the Arctic, splitting the vortex into one piece here and one piece there? That is a significant disruption and one we're going to have to watch out for in January. Okay, that's in January. At this point, through mid-January, the models are starting to hint at it. Do you see it? The cold air coming out of Canada. And while this is a full week anomaly for the middle of the month of January, I wouldn't be banking on an overly warm January just yet. Okay. I think we're going to see a polar vortex disruption that could make things interesting through the month of January. Well, let's come back to where we started. That La Nina is making this big push with these trade winds. It's being met by some westerly winds here right over phase seven, then eventually phase eight and one. Now, why talk about that? Well, those phases tend to be more cool for North America, and they have an impact on South America. And that's where I want to finish up today. When you look at Mato Grosso, which is right here, biggest producing state in South America, since the late start to the monsoon, they're currently sitting about 15 inches in deficit. When you compare that to the previous five years, it's much, much drier. Here's the late start to the monsoon, then very wet, dry, dry and recently dry. Now, before I show you the upcoming forecast, let's go one region south now to Mato Grosso do Sul to Paraná and Rio Grande do Sul inside of that area. It is also now the driest over this such time period when compared to the previous five years in that area. And there are pockets of exceptional drought, although there are some places like you see over there on the map in the last 30 days where it's been wet. We'll finish this up with Arge in Argentina. Now, the area that I'm considering in Argentina is pretty large. It's this whole region right in through here. But still, compared to the previous five years, it's the driest. It's been very dry, and I confirmed this with some of the data here from the Argentinian Meteorological Service near like Cordoba. Very dry in there. And so there's pockets of drought. The point is, is that much of Brazil right now is not uniformly wet. And as a result, we're starting to see some issues with yield and production in certain places. Now, over the next week, look at this. Parts of Argentina are not forecast to receive any precipitation. Same for Uruguay and Rio Grande do Sul, which is this last one I'm coloring in. The departure from normal, very dry in southern Brazil and Argentina. But in northern Brazil and central Brazil, we're expecting some locations in here to receive an additional uh, one and a half to two and a half inches. So that means this week in Mato Grosso, they may get six inches of rainfall. Isn't that crazy? From there, what about week two? Well, let me show you what I've been watching. This area right in through here. Last week was showing wetter conditions much farther to the north. In fact, that whole area. So we've kind of shrunk this region. And now it's drier in Brazil's central and northern growing areas. My concern will be over the month of January. The latest model run was suggesting that this area was very wet with drier conditions on both sides of it. If this shrinks at all, that will be absolutely critical to the success of Brazil's first crop of soybeans. We better be watching it carefully. Hey, have a great rest of your week. Have a Merry Christmas. and We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.